I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Acts chapter 2. We'll be in that text, but we'll also be dropping back uh, some to other passages in Matthew 26 as well. But in Acts chapter 2, we want to talk about uh, Peter just a little bit. The Apostle Peter. And to, to learn from his, his life. I enjoy reading about the, the lives of other people. Whether it's a, an autobiography or biography. Uh, I'm going through um, Spurgeon's uh, autobiography right now. Spurgeon, when he was a young, young man, in his early 20s, he started pastoring at 19. But in his early 20s, he pastored a church of 5,000 people. Like God just used him in a really powerful way. And his, uh, he's written so much, but his autobiography is, is really uh, challenging my life as well. A couple of weeks ago, I, I went through uh, Billy Graham's autobiography again. And just uh, you, once in a while, you, you read some things and you go, I wonder why I didn't think of that. But just to read, uh, whether sometimes political leaders or religious leaders, sometimes when I, I read the political leaders, you think, wow, I didn't realize that happened. Um, and you, you begin to discover kind of some things that go on in the background at the White House or other places. Sometimes uh, when I read them and, and um, both on both sides of the political aisle, you, they're telling things that you think, Oh my goodness, he did oh, He did that? What was he thinking? And then sometimes you, you read it and you think, wow, he, he was just an ordinary kind of guy. I, I was friends, uh, am friends, with a couple of guys that are secret service agents. One of them used to attend our church and now is in Quantico uh, teaching at, uh, at the main area there for the uh, secret service. Uh, and uh, Tony Sandoval, and and one of the guys used to live right across the street from me when I was in Indiana, and he ended up, uh, he was a state trooper in Indiana and then became um, uh, on the uh, Secret Service patrol to guard the president and stuff, and they moved out here after we moved out here, so we've kept in touch with him all, all through the years. Uh, he said to me, uh, he was guarding Reagan at the time, he said, you know, uh, what you see in just his down homeness in public is how he is in private. He said, you know, I, uh, they're at the detail. Uh, of course, they, they just live with the president and his wife. I mean, they're just with him all the time, right at the house. He said, President Reagan would get up in the morning and he'd have, uh, you know, bed head, your hair, you know, it's all kind of sticking up or, you know, or he laid down on the pillow and, and he'd he come out after reading the paper early in the morning and he'd say, hey, you, you fellas want to read the paper today? And he'd give him the paper that he'd had. Sometimes they would tell me, you know, some things in the background, of course, today, uh, like when President Reagan fell uh, on the horse in Mexico. It was really very serious. And, of course, the Secret Service knew about that, but at the time they wanted all that played down because, you know, he's the president. And if, if people panic, oh, what's going to happen if the president... As he got older and his Alzheimer's set in, um, some of the guys that guarded him that were my friends said one of the saddest parts is he would start to forget things. He even It was in, in the book on Reagan where he, w he even forgot that he was president. He'd go to his office uh, down here in the L.A. area. One day he would sit and have lunch by himself at that point. He reached down into the aquarium that he had there and took out the little figure of the White House. Reached right down in with his shirt and all and pulled it out and he took it back to Nancy and he said, they say this has something to do with me, but I can't figure it out. When his daughter was asked whether he remembered he was president, he said, she said, you know, it's not significant that, that he remembers he was, he was president, but the rest of the world remembers that what he did. So sometimes when you read about other people, you, you go, wow, that's amazing. And sometimes you read about them and you go, Why, what were they thinking on that? 
when I read uh, about Christian guys, uh, sometimes pastors or other people, uh, one of the guys that I got to know a little bit about was Norm Wan. I believe it's W-H-A-N, Norm Wan. And Norm planted just hundreds of churches, started new churches. Now, he did. He wasn't the pastor of all of them. Norm had been working with um, the telephone company. And he realized how the telephone company used its stuff to communicate with people. And he said, we ought to use that to start churches. So he developed a program called the Phones for You. And then he would go into an area and take uh, several people. And they would use the phones to call 50,000 people in a community. And then out of that 50,000, they would get roughly um, 5,000 that would say, yeah, send me some stuff about your church. Because they said, we're going to plant a church, and they'd find out. And then they would send them for six-week stuff, and then they would start a church, and their goal was to have 500 people out of the 50,000 that would show up that first Sunday. And often that would happen. And so I thought, wow, that's an amazing guy. And I heard him speak one time, and he said, yeah, but don't, don't make all the mistakes I made. He said, look, you've been around long enough. Learn from my mistakes. He said, I had the, the morning service. You know, we had all these people. And he said, think of how many people you don't know in this, in this service today. And he said, and then they have 500 new people. Just boom. They have a brand new church, 500 people. They don't know each other. You don't know them. He said, I was greeting one of the ladies as she came out of the church and I looked at her and she said, I was trying to be friendly and I said, oh, going to have a baby. And she said, no. <laughs> now he's saying, okay, I, get, I need to take my foot out of my mouth. But he didn't realize he was just taking one foot out to put the other one in. After he said, going to have a baby. No. Oh, just had a baby. <laughs> You know, this guy, she said, no. He said, not coming back, huh? (laughs) You know, you can learn from other people, can't you? That's why we send our kids to school, to learn. But you know something? They're learning more from you just being at home, almost, than they are at school. So... Let me, let me say, why do we study the lives of people in Scripture? Well, let me say one of the first reasons, it leaves us in admiration. Think about it. You know, when I, when I think of Spurgeon and, man, how God used him, oh, that's, that's wonderful. But when I think about a guy in Scripture, like Noah, think, for 100 years, he preached and built an ark. And he said, it's going to flood. And they said, you know, after a year of waiting, what do you think they felt like? You know, for a year you're working on this ark. How far, how far along could you be? If it's going to take 100 years, you know, you're 1% on the way. Your wife's looking at you and thinking, get a job. <laughs> Can I remind you that Hebrews says, Noah, being warned of God, by God, of things not seen as yet. No the fear. They had never seen that happen. And he's getting up and saying, it's going to flood. It's going to destroy the whole earth with a flood. And in Bill Cosby's words, you know, in his com- comedic act, he says, what's a flood, God? What's a flood, God? Being warned of God of things not seen yet. Moved with fear. And for 100 years, just kept working away. Doesn't that leave you with a sense of of admiration? I mean, because it happened. But after five years, I'd have said, you know, Lord, hello. After 10 years, after a quarter of a century, after a half a century, doesn't that leave you with some kind of amazement? He worked on it longer than any of you are alive. Just because God said, do it. That's why we study people in Scripture. There's another reason why we study people in Scripture. Secondly, 
It, it leaves us without any excuses. And I put Moses' name up there. Because we like to make excuses. Moses' excuse was, I can't what? I can't speak. I want you to lead all these people out of, out of Egypt and into Israel. Oh, I can't say anything. But I soon hear, if I study the lives of men and women in Scripture, I soon hear them, I soon hear myself pawning off the same excuses they pawned off to God. Adam pawned off the, the excuse that some guys have been trying to pawn off ever since. It's the woman you gave me, Lord. She's the problem. So why do we study people in Scripture? When we study Peter this morning a little bit? Because it leaves us without any excuses anymore. Let me give you a third reason. It leaves us reproved. Reproved. That word, and I put David's name beside that, because David was a man after God's own heart. But I often say it this way, David was a man after God's own heart and after another man's wife. So you, it ought to reprove us when we think that we've got everything together. We're really walking with the Lord. Here's a man after God's own heart, but still Satan wants to trip you up and destroy you. And so the moment you think you stand, God's word says, take heed lest you fall David goes out and kills Goliath. Takes on the giant. But he couldn't take on Bathsheba in his lust. It ought to just reprove you that you're, you're just like them. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. So when I study David's life, or I study Peter's life, or I study anybody else in Scripture, I begin to see myself and it, and it reproves my own heart, smacks me in the face. Let me give you one more, though, that at least is not the last. There are many more reasons, but let me give you these four. It leaves us or it gives us hope. And I put Peter's name after that because you know how much Peter failed the Lord. But God still, in Acts 2 put him to give the first sermon to plant the church. Now, think about it. Peter had just denied the Lord days earlier. Days. 50 days ago. Would you say, oh, Peter, you're, hey, you're, you're, the, you're the godly senior pastor here. Let's put you up. Let's, you give the sermon, the first sermon to start the church. You'd say, well, I don't think so. You, you, you've disqualified yourself as an elder. You, you denied the Lord. You're not gonna, I'm not going to let you get up there and preach. So it ought to leave you with some hope that even though you fail, God will still forgive. And he can use you again. Now, having said that about, about why we study the life of people in Scripture, on the, front, on the first screen I had... This little guy standing like this, little uh, figurine kind of guy standing like this. And I don't know if you noticed, but everybody was around him with their backs turned to him. They were standing like this. Just turning their backs on him. And the Lord said to all his disciples, that's what you're going to do to me. So let's for a moment go back to Matthew chapter 26 where he says that to Peter and the other disciples. Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 31. And here's what it says. Then Jesus told them, all the disciples, this very night you will all fall away on account of me for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen... This is the first time he's talking about the resurrection. He hasn't even died yet. After I've risen, I'm going to catch up with you in Galilee. 
you know, let me, let me, uh, there are a number of us that uh, once in a while you bump up into the, the doctrine of predestination. You ever heard that, that doctrine of predestination? You bump into it and you think, oh, that, wait a minute, that's not fair, that's not right. Something's predestined. Do you understand that all prophecy is based on predestination? If God said something's going to happen, if a virgin's going to conceive and bear a child, he had to predestine that to happen out there. Do I, have a tr- do I have trouble with that? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. He still says we're responsible. Remember last week when we looked at it in verse 23, he predestined the cross. But we still put him there. We're still responsible. There's both free will and predestination. I don't know how it exists in Scripture, but if you want to know the details of that a little more, get last week's sermon or we'll have it up on the website with a video. But you can you see, he's saying here, look, Jesus told him this very night, all of you are going to fall away. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. What's their response? All these godly disciples, what's their response? Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. If any man thinks he, what? Stands, let him take heed lest he fall. At this point, Peter was boasting. When I look at this text, Peter was boasting too much. And then God took him over to the garden and then he prayed too little. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a terrible combination to have. Where you're boasting too much, I'm never going to fall away, and you're praying too little. When Jesus kept praying, what did Peter keep doing? Sleep. <laughs> He goes on, I never will. Verse 34, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Verse 35, but Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. I said to the first service, I, I, I missed that. Maybe I've seen it before, but I usually miss it. I usually put it all on Peter. But all the others said the same thing. And John was at the cross, but most of the others weren't. Peter's saying to him, Lord, I've got your back. Even if I have to die for you, I'm never going to disown you. You can count on me. That ends in verse 35. Verse 57, Jesus has been arrested now. It says this, those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat with the guards to see the outcome. Some people have made much of he he followed at a what? At a distance. You know, the closer you are to the Lord, the more you realize he's hearing everything you say and he's seeing everything you do. Peter followed at a distance, and sometimes we do too. But he wanted to see the outcome. Verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus the Galilee, she said, of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Goes on. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them for your accent gives you away then he began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them i don't know the man immediately the rooster crowed three times he denies the lord matthew 26 verse 75 then peter remembered the word jesus had spoken before the rooster crows you will disown me three times and he went outside and wept bitterly. Now, if this is the first time you've heard this, you probably think, wow, 
That guy really failed the Lord. But Jesus said that after he was resurrected, where was he going to catch up with him? In Galilee. When he caught up with him in Galilee, it was the third time he had seen the disciples after his resurrection. And you know what they were doing? They went back fishing. So he shows up. He says, have you caught anything? They didn't know who it was. No, no, like any fisherman. No, nothing. (laughs) Only they were truthful about it. Other fishermen, you know, the biggest fish they catch, they just put it in a bucket and don't want anybody to know. Yeah, this is a great fishing hole right here. Have you caught anything? No, nothing. Put your net on the other side then, and they did, and they caught 153. The net was so full, and all of a sudden, it's the Lord. Peter gets his outer garments on, jumps in the water. They were about 100 yards away from the shore, a football field length. And he jumps right in the water. He says, Jesus is alive. And he gets there, and they have fish. And and the, the text says this. When they had finished eating, this is John 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? The Greek word that's used there is the Greek word for God's love for people. The noun for that word is agape. Agape. The verb for that is agapao. Agapao. Because this this, this last part here says, I am loving you. Agapao. I'm loving you. I love you, Lord. I love you. He says, do you truly, agapao, do you truly love me? Well, Peter, let me say it, let me illustrate it this way. Sometimes women want to know whether men, what? Love them. You know, those those really slick guys that you know never want to say they love anybody. And the gal says to the the, the guy, do you love me? Huff, huff, huff. <clears throat> well, you know, baby, there's nobody out. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but I didn't hear you say those magic words. Do you love me? Oh, I mean, I care about you, babe. Did, did, did I miss that? Did, 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 did I hear you say something? Do you love me? Oh, why would you? Why would you ask such a question? Almost sounds like fiddler on the roof, right? You know that. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. <laughs> After twenty-six years, da 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 da. You know, do you love me? Well, I do your clothes. I fix the meals. Why do you ask? Well, because we were matched together. Did you, would you choose me? Do you love me? Here's what I want you to hear. Jesus said, Agapao, this is God's love. This is the love that says, I love you no matter what you do. I love you even if you don't love me. God's love says he loved us while we were yet sinners. His enemy. That's God's love. Peter chokes. Just like the guy that says, there's nobody else. He just gets it all caught right here. And instead of this word, he says, do you love me more than these? Oh, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I, what? I almost wish that uh, they didn't translate it this way because the Greek word he uses there is philo. Philo. Looks like this. And it's from phileo from where we get Philadelphia, which is the city of what kind of love? Brotherly love. Do you love me? Oh, man, like a brother, man. I, I got you back. You know, I don't want a brother. When a woman says, do you love me? Does she want you to be her brother? Oh, yeah, you're like a sister to me. <laughs> what does that say to her? You know? Okay, it's over. 
You're not looking for a sister-brother relationship there. And so he says, Oh, yeah, I, I, I feel you. Jesus is, in verse 15, he asks it. Verse 16, he asks it. Verse 17, he asks it. Boom, boom, boom. Just firing away. The most important question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. What's the issue? Do you love me? This is verse 15. Couldn't get the word out, Jesus said. Lowers the the level. Verse 16. uh, Verse 15, again, it's an affection for. That's what that word means, an affection for. I really care about you. Verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? What do you think the Greek word is that he used there? Same as before. Agapao. Do you love me? It's the same it's the same word for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the kind of love he's talking about here. Do you love me? Oh yes, Lord, you know what? I love you. What word? Philo. Jesus said, Well then take care of my sheep. Third time. How many times did he deny the Lord? Three. The Lord's given him just an opportunity to go back and and to say, you know, it would have been better if he had just said, Lord, I'm not where I belong in that. Increase my faith and increase my love. But when you read autobiographies and biographies, the one thing I like about the Lord, when he writes somebody's Biography. He paints the man warts and all. So that I can say, oh, I, there's hope for me. That guy wasn't perfect and neither am I. Philo, verse 16. Verse 17. The third time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? What Greek word do you think he uses? Louder? Not agapao. He lowers it to the same word that Peter says. Why does he do that? I think he does that because what he's really saying is, I ask you if you love me with this godlike love. Now, Peter... I'm going to come right down to your level. Look at Peter. I'm wondering if you even have an affection for me. Do, do, do you really care about me? He wasn't even asking if it's really deep love at that point. He's dropped it down to say, do you care anything about me? He uses this Greek word, phileis, which is from phileo again. And Peter's upset because the Lord's asked him. Peter was hurt. Let me back up here. Um, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. Yeah, I know. I, I know I know all things. That's why I keep asking you if you love me because I don't see it in your heart. Do you love me? And it's phileis. He says, you know, yeah, you're my friend. You're my brother. I, I have an affection for you. I care about you. But he couldn't, look at the screen, he couldn't get this word out. It just kept, he didn't have this fire in his bosom. You know, if you're in love with somebody, we say it this way, uh, they're carrying a what? A torch for them. Because they've got this, they're all fired up about these, they, they are love. But he couldn't get this out. Lloyd Ogilvie says it this way, <clears throat> it's fascinating to note that nowhere in the Gospels do we read that the disciples expressed love for Jesus or each other. 
on that God, God level of love, the agape love. At no point do they say, we love you, Lord. And yet Jesus constantly told them of his love and of the Father's love for them. Let me give you the sermon in a sentence. Before Pentecost, the disciples understood very little about God's love for them. They understood about healings and miracles and feeding 5,000 people and giving sight to the blind and raising the dead. But love was something that they were learning about. That's why they never said to them the, to him that they loved him anywhere in the Gospels. Did you know that the word love is not even used once in the book of Acts? They're having to learn. But what did Jesus say? By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. But they never say it? Let me give you this. There are three statements uh, that can summarize Peter's life in Acts 2 that I just want, because we're looking at his life and learning from his life. The first one is this. He was changed by the resurrection. What was he like before? He was hiding. He denied the Lord. He wasn't at the cross. What changed a man who was fearful and denying the Lord from being that way to all of a sudden in Acts chapter 2, getting up and preaching before thousands of people. A fisherman that gets up in front of thousands of people and says, listen to me, listen to me. What changed him? The resurrection and his understanding that God loved him and was going to be there for him. Look at the text. Acts 2.14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Before that, he didn't want anybody to hear what he had to say. Finally, he was cussing, cursing, and denying the Lord. But now he's saying, listen to what I have to say. And he's pressing towards the one main verse, verse 21. This is verse 14, verse 21. Here's his message. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not maybe, not hope so, not, well, you might make it. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Simple. How much more simple can you get? Call on the name of the Lord. Well, what shall we call? And then Romans says to acknowledge that he died for you and was buried and rose again and that you're a sinner. Just call, Lord, I, I can't save myself. And you'll be saved. This is verse 21. Verse 14, he says, listen to me. Verse 22, he says, listen to me. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth. And then he goes into how Jesus was a man accredited by God through signs and wonders. Verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you with the help of the good men put him to death. He said, listen to me. Verse 14, listen to me. Verse 22, listen to me. Uh, verse 37, they listened. When the people heard this, what happened? They were cut to the heart. They wanted to get right with God. You see, they knew Peter was a changed man. Think about it. Think of how he changed. He, he went from denial to devotion. He went from concealing his faith to confessing his faith. He, he went from being a, a fisherman to a fisher of men. And what changed it all? The resurrection. His understanding. Man, God loved me enough to die for me. Look, he wants to do great things for you and me. But before Pentecost, they didn't really understand his love. He talked about it. He said, but uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. So always talking about love, but they didn't understand it. And these statements kind of summarize. He was changed by the resurrection. Secondly, he was committed to sharing the gospel. Before, he didn't want to say anything. Now he's going to blab it everywhere. Tell it everywhere. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. 
Look at these, ver- these chapters in Acts. Chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, and 12. All of them have Peter preaching or doing great miracles for those people so they can share the gospel. In chapter 4, let me uh, illustrate it with this one. Chapter 4, the priests and the captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John. And because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. And the number of men grew to about 5,000. Started out with 3,000 saved. Now it's at 5,000 that have committed. That's a big church in just a few days. He goes on. Verse 7, then Peter and John brought before them and began, they brought Peter and John before them and began to question them. By what power and what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. It's what David talked about uh, when he was saying, we wanted to try to get the gospel into every conversation. What does he say here? Two things happen. He was crucified and rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, what's the gospel? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again. You have to believe that to be saved. You crucified him. That's how this man stands before you healed. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby you must be saved. Listen to me. If you are here today and you've trusted Christ, but you do not believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, then you don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. It was Jesus himself who said these words. I and the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. He's the only way. That's why they could say it again in Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. We believe other religions of the world, they want to do good and they want to help people and I'm glad that they want to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, but that doesn't get you to heaven. Christ dying for your sins, being buried, rising from the dead, and sitting at the right hand of the Father. He intercedes for you. I heard uh, the guy, the the military guy that was uh, convicted in the My Lai Massacres spoke out for the first time. The My Lai Massacres goes back to the, uh, the 60, uh, 60s or early 70s uh, in Vietnam. And there were several hundred civilians killed, ch- women and children. And he was convicted of it. And he just spoke out recently. He said, you know, it's haunted me every day. I, you know, what I did was wrong. And, and he just admitted that. He was in uh, jail for three years, I believe, in the of this long sentence that he was going to have. His daughter said, I was glad he said that. You know, now now I think that he'll get to heaven because of that. And I listened and I thought, I thought no, that's not going to get you to heaven. That's what's, that's the difficulty in America. We think that it's gonna, you're going to get to heaven by goodness. It's by grace are you saved through faith. Not, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm glad if he uh, confessed and admitted his wrong. I'm glad that he's broken over it and wants to do what's right. But that doesn't get him to heaven. Salvation is found in no one else. He goes on. This is Peter. Peter who has been transformed. And now he's committed to sharing the gospel. In verse 13 of chapter 4, it says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. You know, if there's nothing else I would want someone to be able to say about you and about me is, wow, you can tell they've been with Jesus. 
you know, if I fail an area there, let, let me at least succeed there. That they have been with Jesus. Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. It's better to obey man or, or God. Here's man. Here's God. I think I'll obey God. You see, he was committed to sharing that so much so it's so better to obey God. I'm going to obey God. What are you learning from Peter? Look, Peter was changed because he understood the resurrection and God's love. Peter was committed to sharing the gospel before he was quiet about it. The third thing was Peter was consumed with the word. Let me say it this way. Let me remind you what kind of a man we're talking about. He was a fisherman. Remember what Acts 4.13 said? When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were what kind of people? Unschooled. And what kind? Ordinary men. I'm glad. That gives me a chance. This is the kind of person he was, but he was saturated. He was consumed with the word. How do I know that? Because when he got up to preach, what does he say? He says, listen to me. And then verse 16, he starts quoting, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Let me ask you, when's the last time you hung around the book of Joel? Here's a fisherman. And he quotes it quite length at length. He says this on verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's, that's a pretty lengthy portion of the book of Joel. How, how much do you know of the book of Joel? But he didn't just linger in Joel. He goes on. This whole chapter 2 is about him preaching the gospel. And he's coming out of Joel. Because, listen, Old Testament people got saved the same way New Testament people got saved and the same way we get saved today. Whoever, what, calls upon the name of the Lord. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. People in the Old Testament didn't get saved by keeping the law. Nobody can keep the law. The law was written so that you can know nobody can keep it. So it drives you to call in the name of the Lord to get saved. But he doesn't just hang around Joel. He goes on in verse 25. David said about him. And then he quotes all that's, all that's on the screen about David. And how David saw, you won't let your Holy One see decay. You know what he means by that? And he tells us later in the text that, that speaking about Christ, his body would never decompose. It went in the grave, came out three days later. He never saw that corruption, that decay. He goes on, even yet, in verse 34, for David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Listen, Peter was consumed with Scripture. This was Psalm 16. We know Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I mean, you know, Psalm 16. I said to you at the beginning, Peter choked when it came to telling God he loved him. Just couldn't get it out. But can I tell you that Peter wrote 1 Peter and 2 Peter? 1 Peter has five chapters. Do you know something? Peter use the word agapao in every single chapter of 1 Peter. He got older. He realized his love had grown. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, he says this, Though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You know what Greek word he uses there? Agapao. Even though you don't see him now, when you saw him, you never told him you loved him. But now that you don't see him, you love him. He goes on in in chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply. This is the lesser love, but this is agapao. Love one another deeply. He goes on in chapter 2, verse 17. Show proper respect for everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Agapao. Chapter 4 of this, he says it this way. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. And in both times, he uses this word. Agapao. By the time you get the uh, the second book, uh, Peter, when he's writing it, In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, he says, Hey, I already wrote you once before, but now I want you to add some things to what I said before. Take this and add this, and take this and add this. And so chapter 1 and verse 5 of 2 Peter, he says this, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness... Love. This one was what Peter said he had all along. You know, I'm your brother. But he said, you need to add this to that brotherly kind of stuff. To me, it's so great that he could add that in his later years of life. The question I have for you, Jesus is asking you the same questions that he asked Peter. Do you love me? Oh, little Lord, you know I care. I'm sitting here in church. Oh, that's not what I ask. Did I hear you say you love me? Do you love me? Well, you, Lord, you know I, I look how much money I give, and 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 I've done. I've gone down to Mexico, and I've gone to the Philippines, and I've gone. Did I hear you say those magic words? He was changed. He was committed. He was consumed. The question I have for you is this. Remember that little character thing I had on the screen to begin with? The question I have for you is this. Have you turned your back on God's love? Peter did. I imagine you can do that too. But my prayer is that all of us will grow and add to that brotherly kindness that agape love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for how it confronts us and how we need to live our lives for you. While your heads are bowed, while God is speaking to your heart through the Spirit of God right now, he's asking you that question. Do you love me? Can you get it out this morning? God, I want to love you from the depths of my heart. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with your soul, every part of your innermost being. Let me fall in love with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.